We are live. So hello everyone. I am Mariam. I'm the director of the Georgian Center of I'm sorry, I'm the director of the Georgian Center for Strategy and Development. And I can almost not believe that I'm welcoming you all to the 10th TRC talk today. We, when we were just developing this format, I told myself that one day I would work up the courage to ask today's speaker to join us to appear on the talk. And so I did after almost a year of doing these talks. And it is my absolute honor to present to you my academic hero, the reason myself and many, many others get inspired to go down the path of learning and exploring all things related to terrorism and violent extremism, Dr. Anne Speckard. And thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. And I'm glad I was an inspiration to you. Hope I continue to be. You do, you always do. Um, before we move to the, um, to the discussion, I will briefly introduce our speaker who really needs no introduction, but we always do this. And we did put out a fuller version of Anne's biography, but um, let me just tell you in a couple of sentences, what an amazing speaker we have today for you. Dr. Speckard is the director of the International Center for, for the Study of Violent Extremism um, and serves as the adjunct associate professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University School of Medicine. She has interviewed over 700 terrorists, their family members and supporters in various parts of the world, including Western Europe, the Balkans, Central Asia, the former Soviet Union, and the Middle East. In the past five years, she has in-depth psychologically interviewed over 250 ISIS defectors, returnees, and prisoners, studying their tra trajectories into and out of terrorism, as well as their experiences in the extremist organization. She has also been uh, training key stakeholders in law enforcement, intelligence, educators, and other, and other countering violent ex extremism professionals, both locally in the US and internationally, on the psychology of terrorism, the use of counter-narrative messaging materials produced by ICSVE, as well as studying the use of children as violent actors by groups such as ISIS. Now, could we have a better speaker? I don't think so. And when I say that this person has been my inspiration for as long since day one, I touched anything terrorism related, I mean it, I mean every word of it. And any chance I get to listen to her, to, to read anything she produces, I jump to those chances. And I simply couldn't move forward with TRC talks without, um, without having Anne as one of our speakers. Again, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm sure that our audience is very interested in hearing what you have to say about the topic that we'll be discussing today, which is essentially the gender role and gender norms that exist in extremist organizations with a particular focus on uh, the Islamic State. Um, we'll also be focusing on the use of children by this organization. And I suppose since we are a little short on time, we do have an hour for this. Um, I thought I would start out with my first sort of general question which is kind of based on my personal experience of discussing these issues, at least here in Georgia. Anytime I bring in the idea of gender into the discussions around anything um, violent extremism related, I am usually met with a degree, with a significant degree of resistance and confusion. So as my first sort of opening question, I was wondering if you could tell me why, why it is that we apply the gender lens to understanding violent extremism and why that, how does it help us? What does it bring to the table? That's a good question. Um, I would say the reason for the gender lens is um, most of our science has been dominated by males and uh, they just tend to ignore the women or else they sensationalize the women. So for a long time with terrorists, um, we had a really sensationalist view and we also had a view almost like uh, we didn't have brains, that you know, women just follow their men and that they're powerless and that they didn't know what they were getting into, um, or that they're this um, uh, kind of sexy killer that's fascinating. And neither one of those is necessarily um, getting at the real truth. And uh, so it's important, but it's also important not to step into that fascination with women as killers. And I think we do because most of us were raised by mothers and it's deep in us, the idea that a woman could uh, take us out of this life. You know, I think we were all at times afraid of our mothers. So it's, you know, fascinating to see violence in women and we tend to 
deny that that exists when indeed it does exist. Women can be violent just like men can. Um, they're less often violent and less lethally violent. Uh, maybe not less often violent, they're violent to people weaker than themselves. So sometimes to uh, children versus to uh, other females or males. Um, but it's important to understand half of our population. Why, why would they choose what they choose and do they have differences? So um, UN Women um, encourages, and I totally agree with this, that anybody that's collecting data on terrorism or anything for that matter, um, disaggregates their data by gender to find out are there differences and then you would also think in terms of should there be differences in prevention should there be differences in intervention and same uh, question applies of do we sometimes need women to do this work instead of men or you know are men good in some aspects of the work and not in others so I worked with Princess Aisha from Jordan on um, a NATO ARW and she fought really hard in her country to train women to be in the special forces. And she said, you know, look, um, the men can't go into the restroom with me, but if I have a special forces uh, female, she can follow me everywhere. And uh, amazingly, after she won her battle and got them trained, one of her female special forces uh, saved the king's life, which is pretty cool. That's very true. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, the idea of sort of needing to, us needing to concentrate on uh, both male and female genders is sort of, it, it almost feels like a self-evident truth, which then sometimes confuses me. The, 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 the resistance to it sometimes confuses me, but then I, of course, I understand that if, I mean, this, if, if there is this confusion, then we do need to explain a little more what it is that we would be missing out if we were not considering the gender, um, if we were not applying the gender uh, lens to our analysis. So um, I was wondering if we could then move on to what we already know about the gender roles that exist in extremist organizations. And shall we then start by, I suppose, the role that men typically play in extremist organizations, perhaps with a focus on ISIS and how ISIS has formed its I'm a little reluctant to use this term, but let me call, call this gender ideology. Let's call it that. Okay. Um, well, we know that terrorist groups, there, there were some terrorist groups um, early on before Al-Qaeda and the rest of them that did have women in leadership. But when we're looking at militant jihadist type uh, terrorist groups, and these are people that call themselves jihadists and are militant. So they're you know following Islam as they claim they are. Um, for a, a militant uh, purpose and using suicide terrorism, um, claiming that everyone has a, a Islamic duty to follow jihad in these groups. And groups like that would include ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, uh, they're male dominated. And uh, so women very rarely rise all the way up to leadership roles. And um, we saw the same thing with Palestinians. But when we go way back to look at the Chechens, the suicide bombers, they were represented right from the beginning with women. The first ones were two women. And the total group of suicide bombers for Chechens was 50% uh, female, 50% males. Uh, they often went as pairs, probably to deceive security services that they were a couple and you know, not up to anything dangerous. And um, they did tend to send them uh, by twos, I think probably to bolster their courage to go through with it. Um, and Palestinian women would go to their leaders and beg to be treated like the Chechens. So I talked to Zechariah Zubedi, who was um, head of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade in uh, Janine. And he said many more women came to him than men asking to be sent as suicide bombers. And I asked him why that was. And he said, well, um, and they didn't allow it. They turned them away. Most of the Palestinian groups turned women away um, in the beginning. And he said, well, they come because that's what they can do. They, we don't give them a rifle. They can't go out and be an actual fighter, but they can strap a bomb to their bodies and fight. Um, the Palestinians did start to use women later 
um, when they couldn't cross checkpoints anymore and females could cross more easily. And that's what I predicted would happen with Al Qaeda in Iraq, uh, first time around before uh, morphed into ISIS, that as they got boxed in, which is exactly what they did, that they would start to use females where they hadn't used them before. So we suddenly saw a spate of females going as suicide bombers because they could send them with their bomb vest hidden under a, a burqa. And they would send them to the military training and police training sites, pl places where men were gathered that were um, opposing Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, ISIS did the same thing. They didn't use women early on, but we saw a fatwa uh, issued by al-Baghdadi saying that women didn't have to ask their husbands or their fathers that they could go. And then later when um, Mosul got heavily under bombardment and the Iraqi and Syrian leaders wanted to escape back into Syria, um, they used female bombers and, and they had used them here and there before. But when we look at ISIS um, and Al-Shabaab, I, I don't know if they've used female bombers. I'd have to think about that. It doesn't come right to, to mind. But all of these people, as far as having an ideology about females, well, I guess maybe I'll just say ISIS had many roles for women. So when foreign women came in, knowing that they knew all their uh, different languages, um, and there were 110 countries uh, represented in ISIS, it's very interesting to go do interviews with ISIS prisoners because um, <laughs> you, you can cover so many different languages. It's kind of mind blowing. Um, and you know sometimes you can't communicate because you don't have that translator with you. But um, so 40,000 foreigners came and uh, I think about 20 to 25% were women that traveled into ISIS. I'm not sure on those statistics. I'm just saying from the top of my head, but um, ISIS wanted to attract women because they were state building and they wanted families, they wanted uh, stability, they wanted the men to be happy. Uh, they also captured the Yazidi women and gave them as um, uh, sex slaves to be raped by the men so that they would be sexually satisfied and um, stay with the group. But women were seen as uh, family builders and foreign women were asked, um, would you like to join the ISIS Hizbah if they were in Raqqa? And that was the morality police. Or would you like to uh, join the media? And uh, some women were quite prolific as bloggers, uh, reaching out to others in their own language, telling them that they could get married, talking to men, trying to seduce them to come, um, sometimes marrying them over the internet. Um, but otherwise, women were put in madafas, that's guest houses. And uh, uh, they had to wait till their husbands came back from Sharia and military training. And um, uh, they were to set up their families. And um, some were trained to be um, uh, militants, but not the majority. The majority were housewives. So as far as an ideology of females, I would say that um, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab hark back to um, a version of Islam that nowadays is usually called Salafi Islam, the idea that you follow the prophet in his uh, first generations of companions, you dress exactly like them, you try to do everything as the prophet did, and you don't adjust for that it's um, uh, so many years later and that there's a lot of differences. And so the funny thing is they use computers and cameras and phones, but insist to have their clothing a certain way or their um, social mores a certain way. And, and set up their state a certain way, even though international politics has greatly changed since the time of the prophet Muhammad. Um, so their ideology is very conservative about women because it reflects this going back in time and that women are supposed to be um, in the home domain and the man is outward facing. And this is a part of conservative Islam. It's not necessarily a part of terrorist groups, but then it's brought into the group and it's followed and, um, and then brutally enforced in the case of ISIS. Thank you for that. I made so many notes for follow-up questions. Um, so one thing I think that we've established is that, for instance, ISIS, as well as other organizations before ISIS, they do tend to adapt their approach to women based on the tactical sort of war, the 
uh, tactical needs of you know whatever the cause that they are engaging, whatever the conflict, that military conflict that they may be engaging. I was wondering if um, did what was did, did we witness the change in the role that we that that women's occupied in ISIS since the fatwa? Like, did the number of female fighters grow? Presumably, it did since the since the um, since that fatwa that you mentioned by. Uh, by al-Baghdadi, but did we see them in specific fighting positions or was it just or so, so, sort of like supporting positions in the field as well? Well, we saw um, a change over time to even use ISIS uh, women in the, in the Hizbah because when the Hizbah was first put together, the morality police, it was all men. And ISIS at first tried to win hearts and minds. So they understood in Raqqa that they were really alienating the local population, that a man would do basically a shakedown and say, you know, sister, you're not, um, you're not uh, dressed appropriately, I'm gonna take you to prison or uh, flog a woman right on the street. And um, so the pushback was uh, strong to that, that why are men handling our women, as particularly in an organization that espouses a conservative view of Islam where that wouldn't be appropriate. And um, so women were added to the Hizbah, but these women were terribly brutal. And as ISIS morphed and there were more attacks from the outside and more fears that people were guiding those attacks from the inside. So ISIS leaders became very afraid of a lot of their foreign fighters and would accuse them of being spies for Western countries, putting um, GPS chips to guide the missiles, things like that. And um, so the Hezbollah became brutal from both males and females, and uh, ISIS became more brutal. And they started um, giving up on their idea of hearts and minds and just uh, uh, scaring people into compliance, which they were really successful at. That's very true. I was wondering if we could go a little further back and perhaps explore a little bit how ISIS communicated, because we do know that ISIS had a very sophisticated communication strategy and they did use a lot of sophisticated meth methods of communication as well. Is there something that we can say that was specifically designed to influence women specifically to join uh, the group and to sort of become part of the caliphate? Sure. Um, I think there's a couple of papers on our uh, website on that. And um, I think there's one that um, another author wrote. I'm losing her name right now, Norwegian. And uh, I wrote one that had the 10, the 10 calls of uh, ISIS to women. But basically, they were looking for um, how can we appeal to, to the Islam you're following? And if you're following a conservative Islam, that you'll have a sisterhood here, that you can live a traditional lifestyle, that um, uh, no one will harass you for being in a niqab. And you know, in some Western countries, if you're wearing a headscarf, and even more so if you're wearing a black burqa and a niqab, um, you can get spit on on the streets, you can get called names pushed around, people can try to take your headscarf off. And there was this promise that you come here, you'll be treated with respect. Women were also told that they were needed as professionals, that they would be trained to be nurses and um, have real professional roles. Um, I'm thinking of Lisa, uh, Laura Pisoni. She was a woman from um, Belgium that had just gone through a divorce. And she was told by her ISIS recruiter that they would train her, I think, to be a teacher. She said no such thing happened. She was locked in her house and she was always afraid that her son was going to be taken off to um, fight with the cubs of the caliphate. Um, a lot of women told me that, that they were very afraid of their sons being basically abducted into being child soldiers. Um, then they, ISIS also appealed um, through flirtation. They, you know, there's a case of a woman that posed as someone that wanted to go to ISIS, uh, a French journalist, and uh, she put up on her Facebook page a French uh, ISIS fighters video. He contacted her immediately and said, um, uh, here's some more pictures of me. I'm glad you liked the video. Um, you know, we're all really um, handsome here and hot. You know, what do you think of me? Would you like to get married? And, you know, she said, Probably he was already married, but he was, you know, playing with her. And then he started stalking her on, you know, texting her nonstop, Skyping with her. 
and uh, trying to convince her to come and to bring another girlfriend. So he was appealing to this sense of adventure, to romance, telling her that they would have a real hot sex life, but that she would have to dress conservatively out in public, but that she should bring sexy lingerie with her. Um, so there were all kinds of guys doing seduction. And there were many men that told me that they attracted a woman over the internet, married her over the internet, and then she traveled into ISIS. Um, let's see, what else? I mean, they appeal to all kinds of different things, a sense of that you'll, that you'll have a meaningful life here. Kimberly Pullman from Canada uh, was deeply, deeply depressed, suicidal because uh, she'd been raped and she ended up marrying somebody in ISIS over the internet. And he told her, why aren't you coming here? You're a nurse, um, you need to come. Uh, the children need you. Uh, think of all the good you could do for Syrian children. And she didn't tell him, but she said she started weighing, you know, should I commit suicide, just get away from all this pain, or should I get on a plane and go to Syria and help children? And she decided it's a sin to commit suicide. Um, she would go to ISIS. Of course, it wasn't anything like she'd been promised. And, and you know, some of their, uh, oh, and women would blog and say, you're going to get a free apartment, you're going to get all these um, uh, benefits on late would talk about you know the new refrigerator the new the new appliances that were taken from people whose homes they had taken over and that everything that you wished for you could have thank you for that at this point i would like to remind our audience that you're more than welcome to ask your questions in the comment section i will then ask nico and my team to send me these questions and then i promise to ask the questions that you guys send us. And also thank you to the audience for always sending us interesting questions. Um, before we move to the to, the, to sort of exploring how the, the use of children, I wanted to ask you a question that is also maybe perhaps informed by, again, my personal experience of, you know, addressing these issues and talking about these issues here in Georgia. Um, a lot of the time what I come across is this sort of uh, a degree of a blind spot that states have in relation to women. Now that a lot of these women are in the uh, refugee camps and there's a lot of talk and discussion about should they be repatriated, should they, should they be left there? Uh, my personal position, my personal opinion about that is that states owe that to their citizens. And even if we have to go through each case sort of on a case by case, basis. However, I do think that there, I have come across this, uh, again, this a little bit of a blind spot where there seems to be an assumption that just because women are almost automatically assumed to have followed their husbands or their significant others and or perhaps their family mem other family members, um, there's almost this assumption that their degree of radicalization and they believe or the extent to which they, sh they share in the ideology has to also be easily sort of returned back or reversed or whatever it may be. However, because they did have the role of sort of raising the, the next generation, not simply physically by providing, you know, nurture, but also nourishment, but also ideologically preparing the cubs to then fill in the positions of, you know, their fathers or, or, or male fighters. Do you think, do you see that same blind spot that I'm, I seem to be struggling with? I did. Um, early on when I was working on this, because we've been working um, since 2015 on these issues of ISIS, um, early on, I, every security professional I talked to, all men, uh, would say, well, these uh, women just followed their husbands and they didn't have any choice. Um, we're not so worried about them. And you would see people bringing the women back and no prosecution. Uh, I think that they were uh, under surveillance you know, I don't know for sure, but I can think of one example that I always worried about that the husband had been a fighter and he admitted to it. And he said that he fought, um, you know, every other week he was in a genocidal fight. Um, I know that he was involved in a really heinous murder that was on film because his voice is clearly heard in it, an ISIS film. Um, he ended up uh, coming back to his country and he was prosecuted and put in prison for a short time. And I talked to him in prison and he was, um, at that time, uh, had walked away from ISIS. He did go back to them. He didn't go back to Syria, but he's definitely still in the ideology. And um, 
the security professionals told me that they didn't prosecute the wife, nothing. And um, I, I, but they said she was still in contact back with the friends in Syria. And I always thought her husband's in prison. She's gotta be feeling a bit hopeless and angry. And, um, and I was also told that she was more highly radicalized than her husband. And I always thought, why don't they contact her to do a mission? I mean, it'd be so easy to equip her with a suicide bomb and send her off somewhere. And why isn't anybody doing anything about this? There was no program for her, uh, no visits, um, just you know, some surveillance of her phone messaging so that they did know that she was in contact. And that really scares me. So I think things shifted when it came to women around the case of Shamima Begum. When Shamima was found in the camps and she said things to Andrew Lloyd, which to me, you'd have to take in context because I've heard this so many times that when people are asked about the ISIS beheadings, the executions, oftentimes they'll explain, well, capital punishment is in lots of countries. Don't you have capital punishment? Which we do in the US. A lot of people are against it, but we do have it. And uh, you know, in Saudi, they actually do beheadings. But what is the difference if you use the electrical chair or if you use the guillotine? Um, so Shamima said something like that because Andrew Lloyd asked her, did you feel bad about the heads and trash cans after uh, beheadings? And she said, no, she didn't. And that could have been a Syrian soldier. And th the context that was lost was that Syrian soldiers were well known for raping. And, you know, she's a young girl saying that. Um, I think she also said that she was not sure if ISIS was on the right path Islamically or not. And all the men that went into ISIS took uh, in-depth Sharia, Sharia training from very good scholars um, who taught them that this was absolutely the right path of Islam, that only ISIS had the true Islam and that everyone else could be takfird, uh, called apostates and killed. So, it doesn't surprise me that a girl that went in at 15 would be confused about that. So if I was talking to a security professional now, they'd probably tell me we can never let Shamima come back. She's a, uh, you know, horrible danger to our society where I think she's probably not at all a danger. She's really sick of ISIS. Uh, she's, you know, taken off her headscarf. She's defied them. She's uh, told people recently that she's very afraid the ISIS women who are still very dedicated to ISIS will burn her tent and harm her, which they very well might do. There's been murders in the camps between the women. And uh, so, you know, there's a spectrum and it's neither this or that. It's there's some women that are still in the camps. I just talked to a Belgian woman last night that came home this summer and she said there was one of us that refused to come home. And she said, I was asked um, if I was still dedicated to ISIS because some people had gossiped about her and the judge asked her, um, we were told that you wore Islamic clothing in the camp, that you were talking pro-ISIS and uh, we think you're pro-ISIS. What do you think, what do you have to say about that? And she said, if I was, I would have stayed because we were given the choice to leave or to stay. And, uh, and that's how a lot of the repatriations are being done now. That doesn't mean that a woman wouldn't uh, choose to be a sleeper cell and go home and try to do something at home. But there is the spectrum of so diehard, so dedicated that they'll stay in the camp, hoping that the ISIS guys are gonna come and break them out of that camp and that the caliphate will reemerge. And then there's others that believed the ISIS lies, came to the, uh, caliphate thinking it was going to be grand and glorious they were locked up in a filthy madafa and that was their first indication that things aren't as they seemed and then they were under total totalitarian control by a very brutal organization and they came to their own awakening that this is not islam and it's corrupt brutal and un-islamic and i don't want any part in it and some of them had family members killed right in front of them they're never going to go back to isis never so if I was talking to a security professional these days, I would say, where do you think this woman is on the spectrum and where's your evidence? You know, what is she saying? What do we know that she's done? What are other people saying about her? How is she acting? How is she acting when she doesn't think anybody's watching her? Um, wh what is she texting and sending out on the internet? 
Who is she communicating with? You know, a 360 around her. And then let's put her where she belongs on the spectrum and let's make an intervention based on that. Yeah, that's true. And then very often security officials will sort of, um, they will state that there's not enough, there, that it's very difficult to collect evidence from the from the conflict zone, especially for countries such as, let's, for instance, Georgia, that may not have the same intelligence capabilities that other states like the US might have. Um, but I was going to ask you about Shamima Begum as my follow-up question, and then let's, you mentioned let's, her. Let's just uh, uh, address that for a second. Sure. A lot of these women will tell their own stories. So it's possible to interview them and get their own stories. And true. you can decide, is this a coherent and believable story? And also the FBI cooperates with other countries all around the world. So uh, there's many countries that ha don't have um, uh, boots or shoes on the ground in terms of intelligence uh, professionals, but the coalition in the US is sharing data with them. That, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Thank you for making that point. Um, as for Shamima, before we, and then I really want to move to discussing the, exploring the, how, how children are being used. Um, first of all, do you think there is a chance for her to be returned to the UK? Because I did watch her last, like the last interview that, that, that she gave uh, to one of the UK uh, channels. I don't quite remember which one it was. And she did seem to try to sort of make the authorities see the value that she could bring in terms of I think the, the exact quote was, I can tell you what you're doing wrong. So do you see the value in sort of using her experience with ISIS to then either help prevent future cases or to help de-radicalize some of the women that may already be engaged? Well, a lot of these people, well, all of these people are not supposed to have phones, but they end up um, communicating with people like me. Um, I think, um, uh, is it Vera Miranova? I think her research is based entirely on WhatsApp conversations with people in the camps. Um, but they do communicate. And what I hear from a lot of them is we're valuable to the security services. And I think it's a, mm, a mistaken argument, actually. Uh, they probably are valuable. But you know they're sitting in a camp, and the uh, intelligence organizations would probably love for them to sit there forever because they are a source of intelligence and um, you know they can go and talk to them anytime they want that if they are of the cooperative sort, uh, they'll continue to cooperate in the hopes that they'll get home. So that argument I think is a weak one to come home um, because everything the UK wants to get from Shamima they can get right while she's sitting in the camp. Um, and maybe even more uh, when she's sitting in the camp. When she gets home, she may not want to cooperate anymore at, at the level that she's chosen to, if she's cooperating now. Um, but I gather that all of them have been interviewed extensively. Um, uh, and I gather that from my security services, not, not from anything that they've said. Um, and it just would make sense. Of course, they've been interviewed. Everybody in the prisons has been interviewed by. FBI and security services. Um, so will she get home ultimately? Yes, of course she'll get home. Um, no one is going to stay in these Syrian prisons forever. I mean, if, if the Syrian, the, the Ains government, the Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria, the SDF, had some kind of hybrid tribunal or even under their own courts um, held a tribunal, they're not gonna give a longer prison sentence than probably um, Europeans would give. And I think Shamima, if she went home to mainland Europe, she'd probably get three, four years in prison, maybe a stay of sentence. In UK, it might be tougher. In the US, she might get 15 years. Um, although I think that she went as a 15 year old would certainly be taken into, um, into consideration. But just consider even if it's uh, 10 years that she gets. In 10 years, uh, she's out of prison. So what do the, what do the Syrians do with her then? I think she's been stripped of her passport. Um, you know, but they're not going to want her to live in their country, and um, you know she's got to go somewhere. And international law is such that you're not allowed to render a person stateless. And the UK has claimed 
that she's uh, passport eligible because of her father. They went and studied the laws of Bangladesh, but it doesn't matter. The government of Bangladesh has says we're never ever issuing a passport for her. So yes, she'll get home eventually. Um, the public sentiment is so strong against her. It's, um, it's like frothing at the mouth against her. Whenever I post anything about her case on LinkedIn, I'm just amazed at the vitriol that comes out of UK citizens speaking about her. And it, it boggles my mind that up until she made that interview with Andrew Lloyd, um, she was this poor victim, a 15 year old that was tricked into going to ISIS. Everybody saw those pictures of her going through the um, airport with her two friends looking like she was on a grand adventure. And, uh, Everybody wondered what happened to those girls, you know, will they ever be brought back? People pledged that they would help them if they could get that home. And then suddenly it was like this evil woman, which is something that we do to women, that we, we put them black or white, you know, uh, pure woman whore, um, uh, evil good. Uh, and she's just been painted pure black evil. And... Um, so I don't think it's going to be quick in her case. And, um, but the argument for me is she was 15 when she left. And as far as um, people getting home, there, there is a legal argument that most often you are tried in the country where you committed your crime. So some people say they should be tried in Syria and they should be held in Syria to pay for their crimes and that their crimes were more against the Syrian people than anybody else in the world, or Iraqi people if they get caught in Iraq. That's certainly Iraq's stance. Um, but we have to keep in mind that most of these people traveled into Syria illegally. So they left our countries, and our countries um, had different points of view on this. Uh, Belgian police told me at one point, um, we looked at it as flush in the toilet. We were like, good riddance, go. And uh, uh, parents in Belgium told me, we went to the police and said, um, I'm worried about my child. And they would say, well, he's over 18, he can do as he like. And they didn't stop them. So doesn't that put some responsibility on our countries? It absolutely does. And I think that the longer these people spend the time in, in, in refugee camps, the more difficult and more protect, protracted um, risk it will become in the long run for the national security of any country that's currently holding them but also like you said for instance Shamima will return home one day and if we assume that Shamima is already de-radicalized de we cannot make the same assumption about everyone that's there so the longer they stay there we run the risk of either the sort of the depth of radicalization becoming even greater or people who may not may have been on the path of disengaging I don't know if re-engaging is the correct word to use here, but I, I think I've managed to make my point that in the long run, this does seem to, 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 be a, to become even, yeah, an even greater risk. Um, I, I'm not a real subscriber to the idea that the longer they stay, the more radicalized they'll become. I find the opposite, that the longer they stay, the more disillusioned they come, become, but they're broken people. And um, uh, we had a general that said, if we don't, get these kids home from the camps, we'll meet them on the battleground in the future. And it's true for some of the kids, their mothers are highly radicalized, they're still in the Hizbah, uh, they punish other women, they stab them, they burn their tents, they um, teach their kids to throw rocks at the other women that are no longer following ISIS. Those ones, we will meet them on the battleground and they're becoming trained and hardened. Um, and probably they should be removed from their parents and their parents should be um, dealt with appropriately by legal authorities and maybe reunited at some point. But the majority of the women that I've talked to um, are just disillusioned. And, but the children are really suffering because the schools are bad. Um, they, they're illiterate in their own language most often because um, you can't get English books or Norwegian books or Georgian books um, in the camp. So your kid will go to school and learn in Arabic and okay, he'll have another language. The woman I just talked to that returned to Belgium was telling me how multilingual her kid was because of uh, living in the camp, there's an advantage. 
but most of the kids are going to come home really behind in school uh, not not knowing what's what, maybe with some health deficits. And if they've been malnourished, I mean, that can affect your brain for your entire life and your body. But I don't think that they're going to become more extremists necessarily from staying in the camp. I think they're just going to be broken and uh, harder to, to rebuild when they get home. So, you know, if you bring a, a little child home and nurture him and nurture his mother as well, um, they'll get on their, on their feet and run. But if you leave somebody in a camp for six, seven years, and some of these people have been in the camps four or five years now, yeah. you know, freezing cold in the winter, they're hot in the summer, there's disease going around, the food is not good, unless their families are able to send them money. So we do have children that were born in the, in the camps, but we also have children that were born when the caliphate was sort of doing much better and was was going strong and we know that there was this whole process of indoctrination of children and training of children so i think this kind of brings us to the to the to the part of our conversation where we'll be exploring how children are being or were being used by isis so what was that process like what have you perhaps found out in in, in your interviews in addition to sort of what's generally known about this well, children were kidnapped by ISIS, so they would, you know, come into towns and take the town's children and put them into the cubs of the caliphate. Kids were also seduced into the cubs of the caliphate. So I talked to a lot of Iraqi teenagers who said, I, I went to the camp because I had heard the preachers out in the street or at the mosque, um, and they made amazing promises, you know, that you'll get to have a weapon, that you'll be able to drive a vehicle. And these are poor kids that, you know, wouldn't dream of being able to drive a vehicle. And um, most importantly, a lot of them said, we had food shortages, our family stopped having meat. And I thought I'd get fed better in the camp. And the really sad thing was, um, they didn't. I said, you know, did you get meat in the camp? And that no, it was the same food as at home. And uh, most of those kids ran away. And the sad, sad story was I talked to them in Iraqi prison and Iraqis caught up to them uh, years later after they had run away from the camps and um, they're facing serious prison sentences from being in the camp for three, four months, five months because they swore by bayat to ISIS. They were part of ISIS. Um, so kids, that were teenagers were definitely weapons trained. They were taught to um, handle weapons. They were taught to run around as soldiers. Um, they were indoctrinated into the ideology and uh, some of them thought it was really cool in the beginning. Little kids also were taken and they were trained. Little kids were more often, I mean, you'll see pictures of them trained to uh, use weapons, but they oftentimes use them as spies against the older people. Um, they sent them out as preachers to preach Sharia, and um, they used them as suicide bombers because they were really easy to convince that they're going to go to paradise. And some of the kids were offered uh, a drug before they got in a, a car. Some of them didn't really understand that they were going to be detonated. They could have been detonated remotely. Um, and others were told, you push this button, you go immediately to paradise, and they believed it. Because you know these were trusted scholars that were teaching them all about Islam, and it, you know it's part of the beliefs that when you die, if you lived a righteous life, you'll go to paradise. And they were being taught that this was the most beautiful thing you could do to give your 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 body and your life for for Allah, even though it's, in my opinion, a grave sin in Islam. Um, so, and then little kids were um, uh, forced, uh, they were invited and forced um, to do beheadings. And um, some were quite horrified by it. And um, I talked to one kid that uh, became an alcoholic after um, being called to do a beheading of four Peshmerga uh, soldiers. And um, I was quite amazed that he was drinking an ISIS. I said, how is that possible? I thought they didn't allow alcohol and tobacco. And he said, well, you forget that, that I would uh, work one week on that I was with them and one week I would be home with my grandmother. And he said, when I was home with my grandmother, I would get some alcohol and I would disappear into a shed and I would drink myself into oblivion. 
and he was drinking to try to keep the flashbacks of having been forced to behead these uh, Peshmerga soldiers and he's pretty messed up from it. So, yes. so kids were put in these camps and mothers told me even with really small kids, you know, like five to eight years old that they were so afraid that the soldiers were going to come and take them and say, you know, your child needs to take part in the Cubs of the Caliphate. I remember reading this somewhere. I, I'm tr I was trying to remember where that was, but I, for the life of me, I can't remember the author or where I found this, but I do remember reading about the cases where not only were children invited to sort of participate in beheadings, but also they would be asked to make the decisions about who gets to live and who gets to die. That to me is a whole different degree of whole different level of what you, what you put in a child's young and impressionable mind and the degree of sort of power, the thirst for power that that, that kind of a decision can sort of foster in a child. Yeah, I haven't run into that at all. I haven't run into oh, the children that told me about the headings um, and, and adults that told me about it where kids were involved is that they were just um, called to duty and that day that they were given a knife and told this is your your uh, captive to um, to bed and that everybody celebrated it you know shouted Allah Akbar when they did it and um, that you were seen as the hero of the day but you know it's pretty horrifying. Yeah. I think what scares me the most is that whether it's through training or sort of more education-based indoctrination, what scares me the most is that for a lot of these kids, violence was normalized as, at such an early age that, um, I mean, going back to what, what was said earlier that we will see them in the battlefield later, that's, that's, I think, what scares me, that this is a whole different generation that may be, may be preparing, may, may be getting ready to sort of so not may, maybe sort of actively getting ready, but at least becoming the solid ground for the for someone to then instrumentalize them for their own purposes. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I think there's a number of issues to unpack there. Um, the Iraqi government uh, did a really good job in from 2015, 16 and onward to count how many children had lived under ISIS. So not necessarily in the Cubs of the Caliphate, but you know, all the schools closed and ISIS opened their own schools. And some parents didn't send their kids to school, some sent them to ISIS school. And, but like you said, kids were witnessing brutal violence every day, whether they were in school or not. If they were in school, they were getting indoctrinated into this violence. And um, I, I helped consult on a project that our, our embassy funded with the uh, uh, Iraqi government to, look at how could you train the teachers for all these kids coming back to school because you know trauma's got lots of different faces so in boys a lot of times it's hyperactivity in the classroom in girls and boys but more often in girls might be a dissociative state you know just staring staring off into space going catatonic um, where it's interesting when researchers have talked to kids that are looking so calm and dissociative uh, their heart rate is really elevated if they're, you know, being triggered by a trauma. And to start to work with these kids, to identify them and work with them. And you're absolutely right in this huge population, whether they've been in the Cubs or not, if they lived under um, violence, you know, might live in their mind in a really sad way. And people that have been traumatized, especially boys that have been traumatized, sometimes don't want to identify with the victim because that's a really horrible, powerless stance. So when they're having a flashback, uh, they'll get aggressive because they don't want to be that powerless person. So they'll act out like the aggressor in their bad memory did um, mm -hmm. because they're almost fighting against who they were in the memory. And uh, that's dangerous. And then if I was going to say who I think is the most dangerous people that came out of the, the Cubs of the Caliphate, I would say it's the Yazidi boys. And um, uh, Nadia Murad talked about that. I heard her speak at Doha Forum a couple of years ago. And she said, uh, I have a nephew that hasn't come out of ISIS yet. And I've spoken to him on the phone 
And he said, if I saw you, I would kill you. And uh, it's so horrible to think, you know, that here he's able to get a phone call with one of his relatives and that's what he would say. But we have to remember that the Yazidis were captured. Um, the boys and men had to raise their hands and if they had armpit hair, they were taken off and killed. Uh, the women were put into slavery. Uh, everybody separated from each other and the boys were put in the cups of the caliphate. And then they were taught this ideology of um, that uh, the Yazidi way of worshiping is uh, worshiping the devil, that Islam is the true religion and that to follow Islam, uh, the highest thing you can do is become a suicide uh, martyr and uh, that you must fight jihad and these are our enemies. So imagine the desperation of these boys. And I was told by many people that interacted with them in ISIS that they were really valiant fighters. Uh, they weren't afraid of death and that they uh, volunteered for suicide missions. And when you think about it, it makes sense. You know, they had nothing to live for anymore. That promise that they'd been given, you'll go to paradise and it'll be this beautiful place. I mean, if they had a escape from hell, <laughs> why wouldn't they take it? because they were living hell on earth. And then you hear about Yazidi mothers that got reunited with their sons and it's just a horrible mess because the woman's been raped and she's dissociative. And I have interviewed one Yazidi woman that uh, in an interaction with her, she just fell to the floor, went into a catatonic state and basically replayed rape. And uh, I came back, uh, to consciousness and didn't know what she had done. And her family told me that this happens to her anytime it's triggered, uh, that they never talk about the rape because of that. Uh, and that it happens, I think they said a couple times a day, might be a couple of times a week, I don't remember. I talked to other people that were working with Yazidi women around the world and they said, this is a common phenomenon. And it makes sense. I mean, if you've been gang raped and raped for a long period of time that, you would just go out, you know, go unconscious when you remember it. So think of that mother dealing with a highly aggressive son that's got all this anger inside of him that's been trained to hate his own religion, hate his own people. And you put those two back together. The kid's not going to do well. The mother's not going to know how to deal with him because he's going to remind her of her past traumas. And I thought, my God, we need to offer much more support to these women before they get their boys back. And, um, but I don't have any doubt that any kid that's been put in the cubs of the caliphate at a young age and subjected to all kinds of traumas, that if he's taken out of it and cared for in a good psychological way, that he can't revert because it's just human nature to want safety to want um, love, uh, to want nurture, but you know you have to feel safe enough to receive it. But you know, uh, somebody came up to me once when I was speaking in Belgium, a, a respected journalist, and said, "I don't want these kids to come back to France. Um, they're all weapons trained." And she was talking about five and six years old. And I thought, you know, anybody that's had kids, you know, your kid can pick up a horrible habit somewhere. And you know you can you can drill it back out of them. Kids are really malleable, and you know kids don't want to be shooting Kalashnikovs and in battle. They don't want to be contemplating their own death. They don't want to see death around them. They want to play and have fun. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're you're very right. And I think that as I was listening to you, it just sort of. I was reminded that at times when we, when we discuss these issues, especially the foreign fighters, the people that are now in the camps, all of that, we think about it in the security prism. Are they a security threat? Do, are they dangerous? And then more often than not, we tend to forget that we are essentially talking about a tremendous amount of human pain and human tragedy, which, yeah, again, we tend to forget about that. And and I could talk to you for the rest of my life, but I did promise to not keep you uh, for more than an hour. So we do have some questions, and I will not. And I did promise the audience that I would ask their questions as well. So I now have to do that. Um, so if you don't mind, I will read you two of the questions. 
Dear Anne, thank you for a wonderful delivery on ISIS. The organization has really changed its approach by putting them on the battlefield. I think I suppose this means women. Uh, however, it is also it also contradicts the established conventions and customs about women that date back to early Islam. Do you feel this contradiction decreased ideological support for ISIS? Oh, that's a very good question. And that's why the Palestinians were very afraid to use uh, females as suicide bombers. But the first one, Wafa Idris, when she was, um, uh, people don't even know if she was sent as a suicide bomber or if her um, backpack got caught in the door. Um, but um, Fatah was not willing to claim her right in the beginning. And then uh, uh, people from all around the world uh, started saying, singing her praise as uh, scholars said it was correct. Fatwas were made that women, uh, Palestinian women had the right to do this and it was good. And uh, uh, they uh, made songs and poems about her. So then Fatah said, yeah, yeah, we're the ones that sent her. And um, so ISIS had the same concerns, but I don't think there's as much popular support all around the world for what ISIS is doing. So yeah, there's probably is backlash to use women as bombers, but I don't know. I mean, if you're an ISIS supporter and you're seeing the caliphate go down, you, you probably agree with them that any means uh, necessary to fight back. Yeah. True. Uh, we have another question. Surprisingly enough, Russian Federation is pioneering the children repatriation process. Could it be that one of the reasons for this uh, pioneering position is fear that the children who are ISIS educated and lost their family members due to its intervention in Syria could cost Russia way more in terms of damage than the repatriation? Mm, hard to say. I would say I, okay. I lived in the former Soviet Union for a few years and I would say Russians really love their children. You know, most okay. people only have one or two and you know, just the public sentiment of you do anything to save your children. And I was told in the camps that when the Russians took the first uh, tranche of people back, they um, went for the Caucasian Russians. They didn't take the um, uh, brown ones, and uh, which was disturbing to some of them. And some of them said, you know, I was uh, screaming and yelling, take me too, take me too, I'm, I'm Russian. But they, they were left behind. Um, but, you know, we are seeing that part of the world uh, welcoming back their women and children. I think it's great. And we see different approaches to how they're dealt with. Um, I think all of them should be um, gently coerced to take part in a program, you know, to off be offered if they can. Uh, I, I would prosecute everybody. And the reason I would prosecute people is so that you can hold over them stay of sentence. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, so that they have to have good behavior for the next five years, and that you can say, in order to be out free among everybody, you have to take part in this program. And programs have different approaches. Sometimes they're very Islamic in nature. Sometimes they're very skills based in nature. I would say they should really be tailored to the individual. Because I've talked to women that have said, I still don't understand if ISIS was right Islamically or not. And I know the scholar that we have at our center would uh, fix that pretty quickly. And uh, I just spent some time in prison with him and it was fascinating to watch him say, brother, what I, uh, are you basing that on? And uh, have the prisoner tell him, you know, his vague recollection of the ayah, and then our scholar to recite it to him in perfect Arabic, translate it into English and say, do you know the context of that ayah? Let me tell you more about it. And just seeing the prisoner sit on the edge of his seat interested, fascinated, wanting to know, because he does want to be a good Muslim, but he also has been convinced that this is the answer to his problems, to be an extremist. That's so true. And that individual case-by-case like, -case approach would be so much easier to do in countries that have relatively smaller people who traveled and who now have to be repatriated. And it would be, it would be such a success if only countries would, would approach it with a little more pre-planning rather than reacting to this. I may be speaking to certain individuals in the law enforcement here in Georgia right now when I do this. Well, if, um, if, you, yeah. if you need help, we're happy to come and help. And uh, Thank uh, you. 
I found it really moving to be in the prison with these guys and to see their confusion and to see their interest. And, uh, you know, and it's just so tragic when someone uh, decides that violent extremism is the answer to their problems. I mean, it tells you that they have real grievances. They have things that a group has been able to convince them that this ideology, this level of violence is a good thing. And I don't think it's that difficult to talk people out of that. If you've got a leader and he's getting all kinds of rewards, I mean, you have to look at what are they getting, what are the rewards they're getting of taking part in this group. And in this particular instance, it was a lot of prisoners that had been heroin addicts and the group got them off of heroin, which is amazing. And all I could say to that was, mashallah, your religion is really strong, that's amazing. And uh, look what the brothers did for you, but why would you let them ruin the rest of your life now? That's such a great point. Well, we are at the top of the hour and I did promise to keep it in within an hour. Thank you so very much for this. You're I think welcome. my lifelong, I'll admit that when I created TRC Talks, I did create this as a gift from me to me. And today has been a lifelong dream come true, even though we've known one another a little bit for some time now. Um, I have to say that this particular one was more a gift to me than any other one we've done so far, I think. I'm sorry, this is the truth. <laughs> I'm glad I could do that for you. You asked me to give you a couple of readings. I put them in. Yes. Links. So I put the yes. classes in their own words, which is our uh, compilation, I think of 271 cases that we mm -hmm. studied. The lethal cocktail of terrorism was, just explains my theory of terrorism in general. And the UN Women Preventing and Countering Violent Extremism manual that I wrote. And uh, it's so can, good. But you can go, thank you. You can go on our website, you can have a reading fest, you can go on our YouTube channel, and you can watch ISIS interviews uh, that are made into counter narratives. And uh, happy to help anybody that I can. All right. Well, yes, we did post all the links in the comment section. So anyone watching right now wondering what to read tonight, please enjoy. And um, all right, well, thank you once again. Thank you so very, very much for being here today, but also for everything you do for inspiring me and so many others to stay on this path and to keep exploring this and learning more about this. I hope that, I mean, I know that through your work, a lot of us become better at what we do. So thank you for that. That's really cool. Good to hear. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye-bye, um, America. Bye. Thanks everyone for joining us wherever you are. Have a lovely rest of the day and thank you to my team for putting this together. And I think we're ready to go off the air now.